church said? Amen. Yeah. I, I want to start with, uh, I think I've really had a bad week. I am slightly hard, a hard nut to crack. Yeah, uh, yeah slightly is. Yeah, but I, I, I think I've had a bad week. This week was slightly too, too, too bad for me. I have told you as a church that the devil stays in Ukraine and South Sudan. Yeah, but I think something happened this week. They, he decided to visit me. Uh, we have been together, I think, I don't know. I don't know when did he come, but I, I think by Monday, I recognized that I had a, I had a visit. I had to a crazy, slow, boring, yeah, very hectic week, yes. Imagine doing the week with the devil. Yeah. And my previous week was super good. I mean, I did a lot of things. And I, I, yeah, I did a lot of things. But this past week, it's been, I don't know whether he has left or after the service would meet. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, it was just a, it was just a very, a, a very difficult week to, to do it with the devil close. I had thought he would never would never come again. I think we have met some times ago, uh, but yeah. And, and the sad thing was when he followed me to church because I was, I was here I, and I was in the office and then I also came down here uh, to come and do my ritual of prayer. And the guy was here together. You know how he attended a prayer meeting of Job with God? He was here. And, I, and he was telling me nonsense. Uh, yeah, when we are here, he told me, you see, this church is not growing. You see, you are wasting your time. You see, this is not. I said, no, my guy. I'm building. No, you can't. Do Look at you. You know, these chairs are always empty. I mean, it was such a very tough discussion. Yeah, and we, we went on and on. And I told him, I'm going to build this church. I'm going to fill people. We are going to do this. He said, no, you can't. I said, no, I can't. And yeah, and then we went into another dimension. We spoke about, have you checked your account there? Have you checked out? Do you know? Uh, yeah, you are saying you are building millionaires. Have you, who are you? Are you even a millionaire? And I mean, it was a battle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember at a particular time we were going together in the car and he was asking me questions. I think people that were on the robots thought maybe I'm speaking to the phone or something and we're chatting. I told him, no, this is not how things, he says, no, this is what I'm going to do. I said, no, you can't. And we have been on this journey together, you know. So it's been a very bad week. Yeah. I mean, a very bad week. The guy would even appear in my bedroom. Have you ever been woken up by, not by God, by the devil? I mean, like, you wake up out of a good sleep, maybe you are, yeah, but it was not a good mood. And then you meet the devil. Yeah. And then he starts asking you a question. Maybe you're a husband sleeping next to your wife and then the devil wakes you up. You say, look at this donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know your wife is not a donkey. Or you are a wife and then he wakes you up and your husband is next to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to talk about what he should be doing, but it will be like the lion has come closer. And then the devil says, what is this lion or tiger doing? Do you hear this sound? How long are you going to be patient with this? And you have an attack right in your bedroom. And maybe you go to the bathroom or to the loo, and while you are still seated there, uh, pampering yourself, he comes and says, what, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, it was a bad week. So we talked about a lot of things. We went to different places, and it was such a mess. I've had a bad week. Yeah, I've really had a bad week. But I've told him, I'm going to make you millionaires. I'm committed to that plan. Yeah, and I'm going to try my best. And I told him, I'm going to build this church. And I told him, I'm going to get things that I want to get for my life. Yeah. So... I'm just sharing this because I want to pray with you if you are here. And because I remember the scripture says Job prayed for his friends when he had had a bad life. I mean, an attack after an attack. 
So I want to pray with you today so that in case God will do to me what he did for, for Job. You remember Job got everything multiplied. Huh? Yeah, so the prayer is slightly selfish, but it's holy. So in case you are here, you've had a bad week. Maybe it's not a bad week. It's been some bad months. You can't sleep. I mean, the devil is such a liar. He'd look at you. He would make you not enjoy good food. Yeah. I mean, at a particular time, I went to Avani. I like going there. So I went there. I was eating good food. And he says, why are you here? I'm eating good food. Yeah. So that's how powerful the devil is. He can lie to you on reality. Yeah. Yeah. He can look at your car and say, this is not a car. Look at your house and say, this is not a good house. Look at, look at everything and just look at you. You are even bad. Look at how wrinkles that you have. He's a liar. If he can attack you, please stand to your ground. We, had, we, had, we know each other. I mean, we have been doing this, I think, for 30 years. And, uh, yeah, we know. I know when he has been said, and, yeah, he knows. And there are things we don't negotiate. Yeah. But in case he has visited you, yeah, I, I am a hard nut to. Uh, I told somebody, if I was uh, a CC, I would have taken blanket, squeezed myself up. <laughs> the devil is here. Ooh, I feel like a failure. <laughs> we can't do that. So I came to work every morning. I see it every morning. The pace was not good, but I was working. Yeah. If you are struggling with an attack, lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. Just where you are. It's normal. Don't even look at your neighbor. We thank God. We don't know where the devil is coming after he, <laughs> after he leaves my house. But in case he comes to you, please be strong. Just stretch your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We are here as your children today. We do have bad days, sometimes bad weeks, sometimes bad months. And Lord, I pray for these dear ones, stretching up their hands towards you. May you have mercy upon them. May you grant them grace. May you hold their mind. May you hold their thoughts. May you give them hope that their dreams are valid and that one day they'll get out of it. Help them to stay hopeful in the name of Jesus. I surrender them into your hearts, into your hands, and I ask you, hold them, soothe them, wipe their tears off, and grant them hope that it's going to be okay in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. yes, clap hands for Jesus. I want to go back to our subject, God's purpose on business. God's purpose on business. Here's my greatest aim that I want to share with you is that the God of heaven wants you to think like a businessman. That is not even enough. The God of heaven wants you to be able to make profit. As a matter of fact, I thought, I think I'll deal with that the week that I'll be concluding this message. I'll talk about the God of profit. And I've told you, I'm, I'm a grown-up man now, so I don't want to do gymnastics. I want to deal with things that work. God that you serve is interested in profit. And I know what the critics have told you, and I know what religion have taught you, that as a believer you should not be thinking about making money and generating profit. My approach this morning is not to turn the whole church into business people, but is to ensure that anyone who has an inclination to make money and to make a business, I want to tell you with clarity, that desire, it's holy, it's honorable, and God likes it. Because the world have deceived us to think that those who are in the church should not think that way. I've shown you the first Hebrew way that I used when God is speaking to a man. All of them represent the greatest model of business. No one, I can urge you, very strongly technically, to show you that there is no any business management theoretical framework that does not embrace the words of Genesis, chapter number one, 
verse number 28. Here's what God said to Adam. He said, Adam, here's the first thing that I want you to do. Create a product. And then, after he said, create a product, which means what? Because you are religious. He said to him, be fruitful. That's how religious people think. They want to hear it that way. But he said to Adam, create a product. And then he said to Adam, duplicate this product. For religious people, multiply it. And then he said to Adam, fill the earth. That's for religious people. For us who wants to make money, who believe in the God, who wants to bless us and give us more money, he says, make this product fill the earth. In other words, distribute it and market it to the entire world. And then he said, okay, after you have done that, you're going to face competition. Make sure that you win, my boy. You are my boy. Make sure that you win. What is the word? Subdue the competition. In other words, let your product come out the top in the business market. And then once you have done that, he then said to Adam, please make sure that you rule. What is that? Sustain the product. Manage it so well that you stay in the market. That's your Bible. That's God thinking about you as a child of God. Last week when I was here, I concluded with Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number 5. The scripture says, the diligent man thinks profit. The plans of the diligent are Profit oriented. It's in the Bible. And I want every person in this church, because I don't want to run church full of people who don't have resources. I want you to think profit. It's righteous. It's holy for a child of God to say, How am I going to make profit in the world? How am I going to make money? How am I going to create resources for my children? How am I going to make resources for the kingdom of God? How am I going to make resources for myself? So think profit. They have deceived you to think employment. Even when you are employed, here's the best way to do about it. You have to create resources passively or while you are earning your, your active income that can generate profit for you. All of those you honor and think are rich people, that's what they are doing. They are copying the book you are reading. They are thinking profit. And they want you to think prayer. Are we okay today? It's okay to think prayer. It's okay to think profit. I told you how people thought I was in the wrong place when I was in the uh, U.S. summit. And I'm making plans. I think that was congested because there were a lot of us here. I want to go there in the States yeah, where there are less people and negotiate with firms there so that we can come and set up here and make money because it's godly. Yeah. God is happy about me. He says, that's my boy. Look at how he thinks. And I know how crooked, wicked people think. He's desiring the things of the world. They have deceived you. So it's righteous to think what? Profit. So this morning I want to take you to a text. It's going to be a long text. It's in the book of Luke, chapter number 19, verse number 11 to verse number 27. It's going to be a long read. I want you to, pick, to watch the screens. I'll read in my text so that I can read very fast. While they were listening to this, now, look at me, look at me so that you follow the text very well. Jesus, something has just happened and there are discussions going on. And it is out of this things that were being talked about. Because the version says, and as they heard these things, so this, the people are talking, I'll tell you what they were talking about. He went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. Now, we need to read English with proper understanding. Now, the word because gives, it means the next statement that comes is the reason for the saying of the parable. So this parable is being said because we are near Jerusalem. I need you to mark that because it's important. And I want you to, yeah, they were near Jerusalem and there was a thinking that was prevailing around the people. Let's hear the thinking. And the people thought, because some things have been said, because we are near Jerusalem, these two products create a mindset. What is the mindset saying? And the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once or immediately. 
Jesus recognizing this misconception. What is, does he do? He says, hey, I need to correct this thinking. How can I correct it better? Let me tell them a story to show them the reality and that they're thinking it wrong. Here's the story. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minors. Put this money to work until I come back. Say it with me. Put this money to work. You know what that means? I don't want. It means I want return on investment over this money. It's in your Bible. The other version says, uh, he will give it to you, you have it in your slides. The other version says, do business until I come. I'm going to deal with this, I think, next week or the week after next, whenever uh, the Lord will grant me time. Where am I? So, but his subject had hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they have gained with it. Say gain. Say gain. Yes. So that's verse number 15. Uh, number 16, the first one came and said, say you gave me, you gave, say your manna has earned 10 more. He said to him, well done my good servant, because you have been trustworthy in very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Say 10 cities. The second man came and said, say your manna has earned 5 more. His master answered, take charge of 5 cities. Say 5 cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mena or your pound. I have kept it and laid it in a piece of cloth, napkin. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out where you did not put in and you reap where what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you based on your weight. You wicked servant, you knew it, you did not do. You are a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? Say deposit. So that I can, so that when I came back, I could collect it with interest. So interest. It's in your Bible. You've read important words here. Interest, deposit, money. Trading. Hmm. It's in your Bible. Then he said to those standing by, take this manna out of him and give it to the one with ten manna. Say, they replied, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given what? Will be given what? More. Everyone who has more would be given more. But as the one who has what? Nothing. Even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be the king over them, bring them here. That's my Jesus. Kill them in front of me. It's in your Bible. You know, I believe the whole Bible. I believe it when the Bible says kill them. I believe the whole Bible. I know what political correctness is teaching us nowadays. We want to believe part of the Bible. And when the Bible is hard, I'm hard on it. When it's soft, I'm soft on it. Here is the story that is being told from the Bible. I want first of all to answer three, I think I'll go up to verse number two for today's discussion. But I want us to deal with serious questions in this text. Here's the first question. What prompted Jesus to say this parable? Now a parable is a story that reflects certain truth. The difference between a parable and flock law and and stories that we tell is that sometimes we, stay, we tell stories to waste time with no hidden meaning. So in a parable, there is a reflection of a true meaning behind a parable. You follow? So Jesus is telling this story to reflect a certain understanding that his disciple needs to have. But let's go back to why he is telling the story before we go to what is the story about. Now, here's the first question that we see in verse number 11. If you can go to verse number 11. So, number 11 gives us a clue. Uh, if you can give us number 11, verse number 11, please. It shows us that people were talking. And I'll tell you the context. Jesus had just saved Zacharias. Zacharias then invited Jesus for dinner. You know, when people are around food, they begin to talk. 
So around food, people are talking, and people are surprised that sinners like Zacchaeus can be saved, and uh, Zacchaeus is also bringing things and giving to the poor, and uh, I mean, people are so surprised. This rich man is giving half what he had to the poor, and there's a talk, and Jesus says, I've come up for men like this, and right now, the kingdom of God has come, and I've come for the people that are sick. When people are hearing this thing, Here's what the disciples are thinking. They are thinking, oh, the kingdom of God is about to come, how? Immediately. Now, you need to understand the thinking at this particular time. Is that the thinking of the disciples is that Jesus is the Messiah. One of the expectations of Israel at this particular time was that when the Messiah comes, he would take off the Roman Empire from its rulership. And then the Messiah would become what? The king of Israel. And what will that mean? It means the disciples would become what? Ministers and directors and they will have more power. So the guys are happy. They are saying, hey, it's about to happen. Like immediately. Like right now, we are in Jericho. We are about 20 miles to enter into Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem. So they are thinking, once we arrive in Jerusalem, because they are going there, things are going to happen. We are going to take the kingdom. Oh, Jesus, it's about to happen. And then once you've taken it on the earth, now we are going to fly to heaven. And we would have everything that Jesus has been talking about. Jesus recognized, hey, these guys are deceived. This is wrong thinking. How do I correct this misconception? Then he tells them a story. In the story, a noble man, who is the noble man? It's Jesus. When I see you go, to heaven. I'm answering basic question. And who are his servants? The disciples. Now, I want us to deal with a very important question. And, and before we, we get into that, I think let me deflect back so that I show you one of the problems that we have with business as Christians today. Here's our problem. We think that the kingdom of God is about to appear. Can I tell you the truth? The kingdom of God is going to take time to appear. It's still far. Because Jesus is still going to a distant country. No, I know what you've been taught. I know Jesus is coming very soon. Yeah. But majority of us have taken the soon coming of Christ and used it as an obstacle to participate in the economy. I'm going to show you the week when I come a very strong implication of the Greek word that talks about pragmatism pragmatism. Eh? Ah, it's gone. It's gone. Put it on the screen. Let them read it for themselves. Those who are online would hear it sometimes. So this is what Jesus wants them to do. He wants them to stop from being living in an illusionary world to become practical people. He's saying, guys, stop living in heaven. You are on earth. And respond to issues that you are facing here on earth. One of the mistakes that the missionary gospel did to us is to tell us we are going to heaven. We even composed soon songs to say, Korai, Korai, go Jerusalem. Megana Jerusalem is coming here. That's what the Bible says. Your home is on earth. Human beings were never created to go and stay in heaven. The plan of God is that you live on, even after the old earth is going to be destroyed, then a new earth is going to come. And what happens? Would come and live with Christ forever. Go and check it. And I know a majority of you are yeah. That plan is coming, but I want you to understand the way to live your life is to make sure that you live as if Jesus is coming today and you plan as if he would come after your grand-grandchildren had children. Live as if he's coming tomorrow. Plan as if he would come years later. But the church have abstained from, 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 from engaging in practical business because of the assumptions that we are going to have. And here's what this text is going to show us. Because we are going, to, the kingdom of God is coming. Let's engage in business. That's what Jesus is trying to correct here. He, I'm going to show you that the implication of this means Jesus is saying, guys, because I'm still going to a distant country, here's what I want you to do. Be busy with something that can make profit for you. 
Be busy with what? Something that can make profit for you. Here's my first question to all of you. Are you busy with something that can make profit for you? Because majority of you, you like the norm it will be easy. And busy what thing never produce any 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 profit. Yeah. So Jesus is saying, he's telling this story to correct the thought that don't let the thought of thinking you are going to heaven take you from participating in the economy of your country, in the economy of the world, and running things that are profitable. You have read it with yourself. He says, do business. If you can give me that text, I think you have, a, you have a scripture there that says, do business until I come. So we are still waiting for Jesus. I'm going to give you the context of that scripture uh, to say, do business until I come so that you may be able to recognize God wants you to live a profitable life while you are waiting for Jesus to come. You have a text there, Matthew, no, Luke chapter number 19, verse number, number, th number, number 13. That's the scripture, if you can put it up there so that I can get it, uh, get it right. Yeah. So he said, he called 10 servants and gave them what? 10 minors. Conduct business with this until I come. I'm not trying to tell the whole church into businessmen. I'm not. And I'm not trying to say to anyone who, do, who doesn't want to run business to get into business. But I want every person in this church to have a model of making profit. Have a model of having investments that returns to you some form of profit. So that we minimize certain prayers. We don't need to be praying. The next agenda of this message, Jesus takes it to the next level. And here's the next level. And majority of you miss that question. We need to ask, why is, where is this noble man going? And we answer, he's going to what? To heaven. And then the next question is going to be, while he is away, what does he want his disciples to do. And we have seen it in the text. To do what? Business. Now the next question is going to be, what has he given them? Which he calls, conduct business with this. What is this in the text? What is the minus? What is the pound in today's world? Now, majority of the people confuse this text with Matthew chapter number 25, which is the parable of the talents. Now, in chronological thinking, this is Luke chapter number 19. And in terms of incidents, Jesus has not yet arrived in Jerusalem into Mount Olives. So, Matthew chapter number 25 does not exist at this particular time because it came up later. But here's also the difference because the two parables, they mean two different things. In Matthew, the parable of the talent, there are two distinctions, or three. The first one is that the people that are being given, the servants that are being given, are given different abilities. You remember that? Two, four, six. Not only that, the condition or the capacity of the recipient of the talents that are being given is being taken into cognizance. Not only that, in the parable of Matthew 25, the parable of talents, the reward system are different for every person. In the parable of the pound, the gift is one. Its quantity and its measure is the same for everyone. Everyone is being given what? Ten pounds. But we also know that the gift that is being given has the ability to multiply and become more depending on the usage of the user. That's important English. Usage of the user. So that we differentiate in distinctive language in terms of the Greek thinking. The usage and how the user use. It sounds broken in English. Yeah. 
so, so, so that they are given 10 pounds. The ability of this 10 pounds to make profit and to create return on investment is dependent on the person who is using it and on the energy invested within this particular compound that is being given to them. That's why the lighter one says it could generate interest on its own. That's this resource. can generate what? Interest on its own. It can also be placed somewhere and generate value on its own. It can also be used and then it creates profit. Are you following? I'm technical because I'm, I want to, to close. My time is going away. But I want you to catch up this. So I want you to see what Jesus is giving. He's giving us something that he's giving it to all of us at an equal amount. So that no one says I have more and no one says I was not given. And when you have this resource, you are able to do more with it. And the resource also has capacity to increase itself so that it can generate more value for it. It is within this particular context of this resource that Jesus says, use this to conduct business until I come. And that business should give you what? Profit. Should give you what? Return on investment. Should give you what? Increased interest. Should give you what? The ability to trade. I wish I had time to show you all of those events, but you show them. Are you following? Now, let's answer the question. What are the 10 pounds? So, in order for us to answer that question, we need to, ask, we need to answer this question. What is it that every believer has access to at the same level? What is it? Because it's not like talents. In talent, it's different things for different people. Here is the same thing, equal for everyone. What is it that God has given to us because the king has gone to a distant country. And when we say distant, it means he has gone far. Like, yeah, he is far. He's still going far. And then he gets there. When he arrives there, he's going to take his time. I understand there's going to be coronation. And uh, then, he, so coronation means he gets crowned, he sits on a chair. And he expects you to be doing something there. What has he left you with that you can use while you are here. And I want to give you the answer to that. It's called the weight of God. The only instrument, the highest resource on earth is God's mind. We call it what? God's weight. When you have it, that's the tool for doing business. And I know how they have lied to you. To think of God's word as the tool for your spiritual needs. Lie. Lie from the guy I told you. Uh, I don't know whether he slept at my house. Or, yeah, but I didn't sleep with him, please. But it's a lie to think that God's word, it's, it's, it's only for your spiritual need. No, God's word goes beyond what? Your spirit. It takes care of your soul. It takes care of your body. It takes care of your children. It takes care of everything. There is nothing that we have here that God's word is not an original initia for. Everything moves from here. So if there is any weapon that all of us has, you can, I mean have, it's going to be God's weight. But the problem is, you think you only need God's weight when you, go to, when you are going to pray. I mean, ask me about who wants to run a, a good business. Go to the Bible. When God's weight, now hear, hear this, when God's weight, it's in your heart, in your heart where it gets charged, it goes into your mind where you meditate on it so that you can see the picture, comes out of your mouth, where it becomes a short so that it can move things. Get lived in your life so that it becomes you. When it has completed those four cycles, it's in your heart, it's in your mind, it's in your mouth, and it's in your life. It will manifest the realities that you want. For majority of us, it's here. It's not even here. It's not even here. We speak like sinners. And think like believers. And act like sinners. And believe like believers. If 
Think about anything that you can do. I'll tell you. It's first source for it to become profitable to you. To create what? Value. To create what? Interest. To create what? Profit. It has to align with the weight. You want good marriage? The weight. You want uh, more profit, more business? That <coughs> Sorry. That can run successfully? Is in the weight. You want to raise children very well? Is in the weight. So I want to dismiss this myth. I'm going to ask for you extra five minutes so that I can conclude this thought uh, very well. So God's weight is the highest resource that God gave. Let me give you some few scriptures. Please don't write. Don't write. I'll, I'll share with you in the platform because we have time. Look at me. Now, here's what, here's what you'd know. Let's start with John chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God saw that he his, his only what? Son. Okay, look at me. So the first thing that you know, the first thing that you know, that is a qualifying word, that you know is that God loved the whole world and God gave you what? His son. And his son was a product of what? The love of God. Okay? So that John 3, 16. I'm trying to play. So the second movement is John 1, verse number 1. What does it say? In the beginning was, was the word. And the word was with and, uh, and so, so, so let's, let's qualify that. The son is also the weight. Is that correct? Or, or let's move it even closer. 114. John 114 says what? And the word became what? Flesh. And we beheld what? His glory. Like the glory of the son of God. So we know this transition in scripture. The word which was in the beginning became the son. That's the beginning is the weight, not the son. Because the weight then became what? The son. The son then had to cover himself with what? Flesh. That's incarnation. And this son, who is the weight from the beginning, changed everything. Okay. Come back. Come back. Come back. How does God do things? What is God's instrument of doing things? Is the weight. What does the scripture say? Exodus 15, 26. He sent what? When people are sick and God wants to heal them, what did he send? His weight. Now, all of us here were sinners. How did God save us? What did he give us? His weight. So the most important treasure you have right now is what? His weight. Give me John. I think we have it in John. John, uh, uh, John 8. John 17, 8. I think it's John 17, 8. I want to show you. Jesus is about to die. Let's listen to what he's saying. He says, Father, he's praying. I have given them the words that you gave me. So what is Jesus' greatest inheritance that he gave to the disciples? Did he buy them bread? Did we hear that he left biscuits for them? Do we, do we hear that he bought some big ships that will carry them somewhere? No, his greatest gift to all of them was what? The weight. He gave all of them what? The same weight. Look at it, I think, in John, John 17, verse number 14. It comes out clear now. Uh, John 17, verse 14. If you can do that. He says, Father, I have given them your weight. Your what? Weight. You can give me anything in John 17 from 14. It, it will help us see. Here's what I'm trying to say. God has given you the most important treasure in all the universe that holds everything together. What is its name? The weight. In Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 3, it says, and then God said, John 1, 1 said, in the beginning was what? The weight. So God does everything by what? By his weight. And look at, look at the transition. Please see that, see that, see that. It's important. Look at the transition. When Jesus is going away, he is giving to us the highest resource that they, the gods, please excuse my, my language, the gods, Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, he's giving us the resources that has been exclusive to them. He's saying, take. This is the way. Use it to make what? Profit. And we are sitting here having the most powerful resource called the word of God. 
that can change your life. And that's how as a believer, as a Christian businessman, as a Christian businesswoman, you don't do business the world's way. Because the world's way, you need to bribe, you need to get network. You need, no, you do the business from the resource of God's way. You drive towards profit by prioritizing God's weight. And then God's weight creates avenues for you to do what? To make profit. But I want you to be settled for today's discussion. God's weight is not only meant when you are afraid that there is a demon in the dark. God's weight is needed when you are in office and you are dealing with statistics. You need God's weight there. God's word is needed in your office when you need promotion. God's word is needed when you are dealing and negotiating a deal. That's why you need the resource that creates what? Profit. So change your perspective of what are you doing when you are reading the Bible. Change your perspective of what it means when you take your time to come into this place. Because this is the highest important place on earth. I can argue that. Yeah. And it's, it feels bad when it's the pastor is saying that because you're thinking, oh, this guy wants us to come here. No, he wants us to come. No, that's not the story. The story is this is the only place that empowers you with a resource that you can take to your children, that you can take to your workplace, that you can take to your business, that you can take to your, to your family. Everything that you do, God's word pushes you further. All that I'm asking us to do is let's stop doing church the traditional way. Let's stop thinking about God's word like is the book that I put under my pillow when I'm having bad dreams. No, this is a resource that I fight with to gain more profit. That's important. Let's close with Second Peter chapter number 1 so that we qualify this thought. I want you to see God's weight. It's your health. It's your food. It's your investment. It's your business. It should be at the starting of your business. When you build on the rock of God's weight, you'd go far. Second Peter, chapter number one, verse number three. Here's what it says. His divine what? Power has given us what? Everything we need for life and Godliness. Let's stop there. Let's stop there. Now, his divine power, whose divine power? Jesus' divine power provides us. Look at the tense. The tense is past perfect. It has been given. The process of giving has already been done. So you don't go and pray, Lord, give me things for life and for godliness. They have been given. What do you do? You search for them so that you can get them. Are you following? Now, let's look at the mechanism. Now, look at the distinction, please. It's for life. And I think it's written for non-spiritual people because this is Peter writing. He differentiates between life and godliness. So if you need speaking in tongues, there are resources that you can use to cast out devils and so forth. And there are also things that we are given for life, for raising up your kid, for building a house, for creating an investment. Where do you get those things as a believer? Where do you get them? from the divine power of Christ. But how do you actually get them? I want you to see that. He says, everything we need for life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him. How do we get knowledge of him? It's through the word. So you have everything you need in your phone, in your Bible. Please value it. Please read your Bible for your own good, not to create impressions, not to do what? To recognize, I have a resource here. If I can use it, I'll become better. Come to church not because you want to impress anyone. To recognize, this is an opportunity for you to become better. Look at our pastor and recognize, oh, this is the guy whom God has appointed to make me better. Stop looking at us like we want to put your, our hands into your pocket. Yeah, it, because, because the principle becomes dangerous to you when you look at the good guy who wants to help you to become better as a bad guy. If you have been cheated somewhere, it's a wrong place. We never cheat here. But here's what they're telling you. The world wants you to look at pastors and servants of God and look at them as if they want to take from you. While they're the people that want to empower you to go further. 
change of mind on things. God's word is the most important resource for starting business. We are talking about starting business God's way. What should be our base? The word of God. That's the base. I'm starting it standing on God's word, which does not do what? Does not change. And this word is going to cost me to make profit. I'm going to show you how next time. Stand on our feet. Put your hand on your chest. Say, I have God's weight. Say, I can make profit. Say, I need more knowledge of God's weight. But I have access to it in the Bible. Lift up your hands. I don't know what you want to say to God. Just connect with Him in the next minute as we close. Father, we just surrender our lives to You. Help us to recognize that it's your plan for us to do business while we wait for you. To do things that are profitable. To do things that can help us to become better. In the name of Jesus, we surrender our lives to you. And we pray that, Lord, you may help us. Grant us grace. Fill us with your spirit. Here, men and women, I pray, raise millionaires out of this. In the name of Jesus, build men and women in the blood name of Jesus. I pray them right into your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. trying to turn everyone here into becoming a business person. But I can tell you, I want every one of you to be able to make profit. Life is better than when you can make profit out of your life. And when you think about it, you're godly. Next week we are dealing with children. Bring children into your life. Let's come and celebrate. And ladies, don't delay us. Is that subscribing or pay for for the Queen's Connect? We want it to be paid up quickly. Yeah, so let's do that. Thank you for coming. Let's meet on fellows. God bless you. Have a good day.